friend and I were traveling in the Toronto area. We had gone to a science fiction convention known as, as Ad Astra. And she had been apprenticed to a lady named Vera Williston in uh, kennel management. Vera Williston was the daughter of Sir Gerald Williston, who was Garter King at Arms during the last portion of the reign of George V and the first part of the reign of George VI. So she phoned and we had to come to tea. So we arrived and there was to be another guest for tea. And that guest was late. And he eventually arrived uh, upset, distressed. He didn't really know what had happened. But he had been discussing a heraldic matter that he just couldn't solve with an amateur herald in St. Catharines, Ontario. And I said, I know what happened to you. You got stuck in Averil Brass's time warp. You would go and you wouldn't knock. If she was at home, you were family, you walked in, and you were intending to stay maybe 10 minutes, and four hours later, you're on the other side of the door wondering what happened. And he says, yes, it was just like that. Now, the other guest was Peter Llewellyn Gwyn jones Garter King at Arms for Elizabeth II. In other words, the world's top herald who had a problem, who went to our Baroness Fiona to get bailed out. And I was not supposed to know that. Nobody in the SCA but Brown the Black knew about it. And the only reason he knew about it was he walked in on her while she was still in orbit. He was sworn to secrecy. And he had... Uh, he was bewildered that I knew about it, and the only reason I ever discovered this was that I was to tea with the Garter King at Arms and the daughter of a former Garter King at Arms, simply because my friend dealt with dogs. It's a small world. But uh, that will give you an idea of the quality of humility in their atmosphere. Brown was not supposed to tell, and his jaw dropped when I mentioned it to him after she had gone. Because I felt if she wanted us to know about it, she would have told us. And I waited until uh, we had lost her before I said anything. Um, by the way, to continue the tale of Baroness Fiona, she was under sentence of death when she led us into battle at Fort Erie. They had the attempt to hook her up for dialysis scheduled. She cancelled. There was this event she wanted to go to, so she did. Well, she had no reason not to. And the stent came on the market in the interval that held her veins open so she could have dialysis, and we had her for another six years. Now, she always wanted to complete her bucket list by going to Pensic 25. And I watched her at Pensic 24, speeding around with James just like she did on the highway. And I thought, the problem is not going to be that we don't have her, the problem is going to be out of province dialysis. 
I thought that that was not a good enough reason for her not to be able to go to Penn for 25 because it was one of the things she really wanted to do to make her entire life complete. So we cooked up the Friends of the Union. Now you're not supposed to collect funds within the SEA, but we didn't do it quite within the SEA, we did it sort of parallel. She made medical history. One of the donators to her fund was my doctor. By the time war came along, we were only $200 short, and she felt that she could cover that. She was on a pension and guaranteed income on top of that, just like I am now. And um, yes, she could swing that. The first week of Pensick, she was only going for one week because of the dialysis thing, I told Fiona stories at the Bardic Circle. And when I went to leave, the gentleman who took me on the show and said, I'm over in the corner of the marketplace. Master Charles of Ethelmark, the carver, and he handed me two $100 bills, and all he wanted was a chance to meet her. He got his chance. And he carved the dragon head and tail on the memorial ship that was used for 